Hello, I'm Paul Weston. Now, Robert Jenrick's uh, recent interview with Sky News reporter and uh, Welshman, North Walian Matt Barbett, raised the peculiar question of what precisely constitutes English identity. And Jenrick, who uh, sadly appears utterly unaware of a single book or article penned by Sir Roger Scruton, uh, was not up to the task of demolishing the artfully bearded Barbett, uh, who appears to be baffled as to why the English might actually possess a national identity. Now, English identity should be very easy to explain, and not least because England is an island and has been geographically England uh, since time immemorial. Most European countries never had the luxury of a natural moat, so their borders changed time and again following battles and wars and world wars. And one uh, elderly Slav noted that he had lived in three different countries and held three different nationalities during his lifetime uh, without ever once moving out of his house. And this was never the case for England, and it allowed a strong English identity to develop. And put very simply, English identity is manifested in the shared history of a distinct race of people called the English, uh, who for the best part of 1,500 years successfully occupied a distinct geographical landmass called England. And to simplify this even further, um, it's sometimes easier to point out what we are not rather than what we are. Uh, for example, we're not black-skinned believers in voodoo, and nor are we brown-skinned believers in Hinduism or Mohammedism. We don't wear turbans or kefirs, we don't speak Arabic or Urdu, we don't practice Sharia law. Now, I know this is glaringly obvious, but if we don't have an African identity or a Pakistani identity, uh, what identity could we possibly have in the eyes of the likes of Matt Barbett? And the answer, of course, is obvious. It's obvious. And it's not just about skin colour or religion. If we holiday abroad in white countries, we are noticeably English. We're not Finnish or Italian or Swedish or Russian. We're English. We look English. If we're working class English, it's obvious. If we are shudderingly middle class English, it's obvious. And if we're upper class English, it's obvious. Our very identity, our very core is English, just as it was for our English ancestors who lived so long ago as to disappear in the mists of time. And our English grandfathers had English great-grandfathers who, in turn, had English great-grandfathers. Now, I knew both my grandfathers. Both of them fought in World War I. But I know nothing about my lineage over the many hundreds of years before them. But one thing I do know is that I am the evolutionary English product of that ancient English lineage. And so does every living Englishman and woman. And the vast majority of us can trace our English identity back over a thousand years to a man who would have described himself as an Englishman. And there are very few people in this world who could claim such a thing. I don't remember when I first thought deeply about England, the English and national identity. When I was young, it was just an accepted fact of life. You know, no one questioned it, so no one spent much time thinking about it. You know, rather like fish in the sea, which swim around without ever thinking about the water surrounding and sustaining them. I was born in Malaysia, where I spent the first five years of my life, and I remember nothing really from those early years and have just hazy memories of returning to London in 1968. And I only really became aware of my, uh, aware of my surroundings at the age of six when my family moved to Sherbourne, which is a smallish market town in Dorset, and where I continued to live uh, and, until I left home aged 18. Sherborne has an abbey, and it was built as a Saxon cathedral in 705 AD. That's almost four centuries before the Norman invasion and the Battle of Hastings in 1066. It's ancient. 
and in the Abbey's North Choir Isle lie the tombs of King Aethelbald of Wessex and his brother King Ethelbert of Wessex, and they were both elder brothers of Alfred the Great, King of the Anglo-Saxons, from 886 until his death in 899. Entering the Abbey, entering Sherborne Abbey on a hot summer's day, was an almost mystical experience for a young boy. You know, the bustling clamour of a market town was replaced with a, an ethereal calmness and a flagstone coolness, and the sheer ancientness was overpowering. Regimental colours lined the walls all, all around the church, and they were dusty and faded, and some with obvious battle damage. They spoke of valour and sacrifice over the centuries. They spoke of English warriors, of patriotism, pride and honour. They silently spoke of an England past and an England present. And who were the local men involved in those long-ago wars and battles? I don't know. But the names of the young men who died in the two world wars uh, and engraved in brass on the war memorial adjacent to the abbey I know very well. They were the names of the boys at my local school, of the high street butcher, solicitor and pub landlord, hundreds of them from one small market town in rural England. They died for their country in the muddy and hellish trenches of World War I France. The freezing seas of the North Atlantic and the flak-filled skies above Germany. Now, young English boys in the 1960s and 70s we were all acutely aware of the recent World War bomb sites that existed. Uh, we made airfix Spitfires and Hurricanes and Messerschmitt 109s, Tamiyar Tiger Tanks and Revels Bismarck and Tirpitz. And uh, we knew about England and the English military. We knew what they achieved and why they had to do it. We were proud to be English and we were proud of England. And it wasn't all gung-ho blood and soil. Now, we read Enid Blyton's Famous Five and Richmond Crompton's Just William. We read The Bash Street Kids, Union Jack Jackson and Alf Tupper, the tough of the track, uh, in comics. And they were vivid examples of an England that children could relate to. And yes, they were exaggerated, but they were believably real and they represented a distinct people, a distinct country and a distinct national identity. As we grow as we grow, as we grew, as we grew older, uh, we read P.G. Woodhouse and Somerset Maugham and H.H. Munro, pen name Saki, uh, G.K. Chesterton, Evelyn War, Michael Wharton's fantastical characters in his Peter Simple columns, Dickens, Shakespeare, C.S. Lewis, John Mortimer, and countless other authors who all left an indelible imprint of an England past and in John Mortimer's Rumpole of the Bailey books, An England Present. And we watched comedy on early colour televisions, and we recognised the quintessential Englishness of those involved. You know, we knew, we really knew there would be and could be no French version of Eric Morecambe, and no German version of Ronnie Barker's Open All Hours or Porridge. We knew there was no Russian version of Monty Python, no American version of Only Fools and Horses, no Pakistani version of Faulty Towers. Only England could produce Basil Faulty, Del Boy Trotter, Arthur Daly and Margot Ledbetter. Only England could produce Viz magazine and Peter Cook and Dudley Moore. Only and ever England. Only and ever England. We went to village hall dances and village fates and village pubs. We played cricket on English village greens and rugby and football in muddy bogs. Uh, we attended Remembrance Sunday in the Abbey with a, an ever-decreasing cohort of local old soldiers. We sang in the church choir for two shillings a week. We knew about the ancient and overgrown walled graveyard in Nether Compton that adults never talked about, uh, which was the final resting place of dozens of local people during the Black Death. We were in tune with our national past, and we lived in tune with the English seasons, and we knew about farming and animals and crops and harvesting. The gentle countryside made us gentle people, and this is something I never fully realised until I first viewed our 
our green and pleasant land from the air after flying over the inhospitably Arab, Arab, arid, arid landscapes of Greece and Spain and the violently collectivized landscapes of uh, communist Central Europe. And I haven't even touched on the myriad ancient foundations of England, of Greco-Roman democracy and law, of Magna Carta, of Christianity's golden rule, of the venerable bead of common law, of our judicial system's presumption of innocence, which is otherwise known as the golden thread of the Reformation, Renaissance and Enlightenment, but I don't really need to. Many, uh, but not all of these, apply to all of Europe, not just England. A mere 12 years of life as a boy in Sherbourne, Dorset, England, gave me my national identity. I knew it when I was a boy. It was cemented when I was a teenager. I didn't have to learn it or revise it. I simply absorbed the evolutionary shared history of a thousand plus years of Englishness that was all around me all of the time. And what a shame that Robert Jenrick is either unaware of these simple things or too afraid to state them. And what a shame, uh, indeed a cr criminal tragedy that left-wing television journalists can even ask such a wicked question. Another couple of things. If uh, friends or family members have yet to learn the full uh, scale of the crimes committed by the uh, Covid reaction, my book would make an ideal gift to wake them up. It's concise, but it's comprehensive. If you appreciate this channel, please subscribe and uh, even possibly uh, help support it via um, donations through buymeacoffee.com. Links are in the description box below. Thank you.